Good afternoon and a warm welcome to this afternoon's webinar, Nutrition for Stress, Fear and Uncertainty. My name is Susie and I'm delighted to be facilitating this session for you uh, today. So before we start, I'm quickly going to run through how this webinar will work for those who haven't participated before. Our speaker, Christine, is going to talk to you for about 50 minutes and you'll be able to follow along on your screens and then we'll move on to questions at the end. Now, I know we've all got a lot more distractions at home than we might usually have, so please don't worry if you miss any of the information today. Um, you will receive the slides and a recording of the session tomorrow via email. So you will, so don't, yeah, as I say, don't worry if you've had to pop in and pop out again or if something's, something's gone slightly wrong with your, uh, I don't know, your broadband. Um, okay, so questions are totally anonymous and they only come to my screen. Um, I will read out your questions at the end, but please do feel free to contribute in complete confidence. Um, the more questions, the better, and we'll try and get through as many as that you have um, at the end of the session. Okay, that is enough from me. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to your guest speaker today, Christine Bailey. Thank you very much, Susie, and welcome everyone to our webinar. This is a series of webinars that we have been running, and today we're very much focusing on the role that nutrition plays with our mental wellness. So we move on to the next slide. I'll just give you a little bit of an overview about myself. Um, I'm a qualified nutritional therapist and, and nutritionist um, with additional training uh, with the Institute of Functional Medicine. I've been in the industry now for about 18 to 20 years. Need to update those slides. Um, and I also, as well as seeing clients myself and working a lot in the corporate sector, um, I'm also um, an author of over 14 recipe and health books. Uh, including one on uh, the Brain Boost Diet, which is very much taking a functional approach to supporting mental health and brain cognitive function as we get older. Um, I regularly appear in the media, and we also run an, an awful lot of online programs. Um, we've been doing that for a long time, not just now, uh, but we are running um, what's called a Lean and Nourish Club at the moment for anyone worried about that weight gain in lockdown. So let's move on to the next slide. And uh, today I just want to give you a bit of an overview first about uh, stress and the role that nutrition plays and how that can affect how we think and how we feel, particularly when it comes to mood and anxiety. Then we're gonna look at some practical applications. So what are the best foods, nutrients that we should be focusing on right now? And then I'm going to touch on some of the practical aspects, things like preventing weight gain, how we can um, improve pro productivity in terms of our nutrition during the day um, when we might have a lot of distractions, and then some overall self-care tips um, to help with us managing our stress and anxiety levels. So let's move on to the next slide. So, when we are in a, this new situation, <clears throat> a lot of people are really struggling to find ways where they are coping with this, uh, what we call new normal um, in this pandemic world that we now live in. And, you know, whether you live on your own or whether you've got um, a large family, schedules have been disrupted. We have a loss of our normal daily routine. Uh, we may have a lot of other um, issues that we're having to juggle, whether that's um, homeschooling um, or um, income. These in themselves can increase our anxiety. And also, of course, because of that loss of routine can disrupt our healthy eating patterns. And likewise, if you're living alone, having little contact with others can pose additional problems, whether that's loneliness, motivation, anxiety. But the truth is that what, and of course how much we eat, the choices we make that we put on our plate on a daily basis can have a profound effect on our mood and our overall brain health. If we get our brain structure right with nutrients, then our mental health will improve. And this, out of all the times, this is the best time to be focusing on food as a way of improving our resilience, 
our ability to cope with this new normal and of course as well, which a lot of people are concerned about, our overall immune health as well. So let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> now, what we're really dealing with here is what's happening in our hypothalamus and pituitary. So as humans, we are evolved to survive. We have a range of biochemical mechanisms that are involved in our stress response. And when we have um, what we call these automatic negative thoughts, we often call them ants and emotions that stem from uncertainties, the fear of the future, the feeling of being out of control, these will signal <clears throat> to our hypothalamus and pituitary to send signals to our adrenal glands and we will produce a number of stress hormones putting our sympathetic nervous system into a fight or flight mode. Primarily that leads to the elevation of adrenaline and cortisol are well-known stress hormones. Now, of course, in a normal situation, they are vital for our survival. If we were running away from a tiger, that would be amazing to have higher adrenaline and cortisol. The trouble is that in our 24-7 lifestyle, with this new normal, this new way of living, those chronic hormone levels, those stress hormones, become so elevated all the time that they actually start to change how our brain thinks and feels through changes in various neurotransmitters. Elevated cortisol itself affects our circadian rhythm, the production of melatonin, our production of serotonin. And these all affect how we think and how we feel, and of course, our sleep quality. And elevated stress has also been shown to compromise our immune system. So another reason to really try to nourish our brain to support healthy cortisol and adrenaline levels. So let's move on to the next slide. Now, what we also know with <clears throat> cortisol is that when we are exposed experiencing ongoing stress activation through our hypothalamus and pituitary, this chronic exposure to cortisol actually has a direct effect on how the brain signals and the production of neurotransmitters. And the key neurotransmitters that influence our mood in particular are serotonin, which is known as our mood regulating neurotransmitter. It's often known as our happy neurotransmitter, noradrenaline and dopamine, which influence motivation, pleasure, mood. Now, stress hormones blunt the brain's sensitivity to these, these neurotransmitters and the receptor sites that actually receive those neurotransmitters. And the result can mean that those levels of our feel-good neurotransmitters are disrupted, dysregulated, and that can heighten our depression and anxiety. So let's move on to the next slide. Now, there are lots of signs of anxiety and there are lots of different types of anxiety. Um, there are various forms of anxiety disorders, um, things like panic attacks, generalized anxiety disorder, compulsive behavior. These are all different forms of anxiety, but typically, you may be finding that you're having difficulty concentrating. You're getting much more irritable than usual. You may have sleep disturbances. You may have very tense muscles, breathing changes, difficulties overcoming worries, feeling overwhelmed. And what's happening is that you're getting these imbalances of those neurotransmitters, noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin, but also levels of GABA, um, which is another neurotransmitter, are often very low. Now, GABA is very much involved in us feeling calm, feeling very focused, feeling concentrated. So when levels, levels of GABA decline, that can heighten our sense of anxiety. Let's move on to the next slide. So we know that there are a number of neurotransmitters that can be disrupted. We know that there can be high levels of cortisol. Um, so in terms of how we can 
incorporate various self-care techniques, there are a number that are particularly important. And we're today going to focus very much on the, our diet and the importance of food. We're going to look at specific nutrients that can help very specifically with anxiety and stress. We'll touch a little bit on uh, movement and exercise, We've already done a webinar on this series on sleep, so I won't go into sleep too much, but it's crucial for our coping mechanisms. Um, and we'll look at a little bit of social connection and mindful behaviors as well. I will also just touch on supplements as well. I know we get a lot of questions on supplements. So we move on to the next slide. Well, first of all, we'll just really focus on, on food. And, the, and the, there's a couple of things here to really be focusing on. First of all, what are you putting on your plate and what are you taking off your plate? So we need to feed the brain with the key nutrients for healthy neurotransmitter activity. Ones that are going to in, um, support our adrenal um, reserves, ones that are going to influence our resilience and lower that anxiety. We need to take out foods that may actually harm brain function and also aggravate that stress response further. And of course, that may also disrupt our sleep. And then uh, later on, I will uh, just do a couple of slides on nutrients to support immune function, because I know we've had a few questions about that as well. So let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so the first thing I want you to be really thinking about is, well, for a brain to function optimally, what key nutrients does it need? Well, the first thing is that our human brain needs essential fatty acids and phospholipids to function. 60% of our uh, brain is really made out of a range of different fats and optimal levels, particularly of the omega-3 fats, have been shown to improve stress response, lower anxiety, lower depression, as in improve your mood and also improve overall cognitive function. So that's the first thing. Are you actually eating omega-3 rich foods on a regular basis? Now, the government guidelines is to have at least two portions of fish a week. One should be oily fish. But I would say for optimal brain function, I would actually include a little bit more than that. So oily fish a couple of times a week, salmon, mackerel, trout, sardines, and canned fish counts. Um, if you're vegan or vegetarian, then look at things like flaxseed, chia seeds, soya, as in tofu walnuts, leafy greens, they, they don't contain as much of the um, omega-3 fats and they don't contain the DHA and EPA, but they still contain the parent omega-3 ALA fat. The other vital component are phospholipids. These are essential for the cell membrane. So our brain cell membranes, for them to function optimally, that cell membrane needs to be nourished and it relies on optimal levels of phospholipids. Now, these are found in eggs, seafood, soya, chicken, sunflower. You can also buy um, lecithin supplements and uh, phosphatidylcholine supplements, but primarily look to food, eggs in particular. If you can get in you know, eggs um, several times a week, um, whether that's part of your breakfast or lunch, you know, a quick omelet, you know, they're easy options, but incredibly nutritious for the brain. So let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so we know we need more fats and we need more seafood and oily fish. A lot of people struggle to get oily fish in their diet. So I've just given you a few suggestions here as to easy ways and cheap ways that you can get these in. So <clears throat> it could just be as simple as some eggs and smoked salmon for breakfast. It could be utilizing some cooked prawns. It could be cans of sardines or mackerel. Um, you could also um, be using those as your lunch and dinner options, filling rats or wholemeal pitters uh, with some you know, cooked prawns or hot smoked trout or mackerel. Um, and then of course you can use um, things like prawns and fish and shellfish um, in your normal curries or tagines or stir fries that you would have in the evening. It is actually quite easy to structure two or three of those in through that week. So let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> now, the other area that's really important is to really help to balance your blood sugar 
and to supply the building blocks for all those neurotransmitters that affect how we think and feel. So those serotonin, the dopamine, the GABA, they actually all require protein because they are made from amino acids. So if we are low in protein, and I would include breakfast at this point, then you don't expect your brain to function optimally. So the first thing is, are you putting protein in your meals? At every meal, do you include protein? And I would say at least a quarter of your plate should be a good protein source. So that would be if you're looking at your palm now, a palm size portion or two to three eggs, depending on your, your um, size and your height and your weight at every meal. And that doesn't have to be meat. It could be poultry, it could be um, eggs, it could be fish, it could be beans and pulses, nuts and seeds, soya, dairy. These are all protein sources. Without sufficient intakes, particularly of things like L-tryptophan, L-phenylamine, L-tyrosine, these are amino acids that are absolutely crucial for those productions of those neurotransmitters that we talked about. Um, without sufficient intakes, then it is more likely you will experience um, more problems with resilience, anxiety, and depression. So get protein in. Now, let's move on to the next slide. Now, the other areas, of course, of, well, what do we need to take out? What could actually aggravate that stress response? Well, the obvious one is sugar. And what I mean by that are refined processed foods, as well as just table sugar or syrups because these can promote inflammation, um, they can contribute to mood disorders, including anxiety and depression through that inflammatory response, but also they will more likely cause imbalances in your blood sugar through the day. So ideally we want our blood sugar to be nice and balanced through the day. We don't want highs and lows like the tops and downs of a seesaw or a roller coaster. That's the last thing we want because when we get sudden declines, in our blood sugar, that is when we will start to feel hangry. That's when we'll be irritable. That's when we'll be hungry and we'll be grabbing any sugary thing that we can find in our cupboard. But the problem with that is that we then get a sudden high in sugar and then we'll be followed by another crash. Um, so we really want to choose foods that allow our blood sugar to remain nice and balanced through the day. And that means ditching those white refined rice, pasta, breads, cakes, cookies, and choosing whole foods, whole grains. So it doesn't mean you can't eat carbohydrates at all. It just means you need to be focusing on whole grain rice, whole grain pasta, oats, quinoa, buckwheat, and the starchy vegetables like sweet potatoes, carrots, butternut squash. These are all great ways of helping to provide fiber that will fill us up so we don't snack, but to stabilize our blood sugar through the day as well. So look at what's in your cupboard and try and switch to more whole grain options. So let's move on to the next slide. Now there are some other things that can be in moderation, very beneficial, but in excess and for sensitive people, not so great. Caffeine is a classic example. There have been some numerous studies on the fact that caffeine, when in small doses, can actually improve your mental and physical performance. It's well known as a fitness aid, for example, in terms of um, uh, performance. However, uh, too much, and for some people drinking too late in the day, can upset their blood sugar. It can spike your cortisol, so your stress hormones, and that then can um, affect your anxiety and also interfere with sleep. If we really want to help our levels of anxiety and our resilience, we need to make sure we're doing whatever we can to get good quality sleep. And caffeine, particularly when it's later in the day, can upset that um, circadian rhythm. We go on to the next slide. Uh, there is always a question about, well, how much is too much? And the fact is it depends. Our genetics are very different. Some people are slow metabolizers of caffeine, others are very fast metabolizers of caffeine. Um, and so what one person can cope with, another person may not. Remember as well, the half-life of caffeine is around about five to six hours. 
which is why it's often recommended that if you do want your caffeine, particularly if you're doing work and you are very productive in the morning, then have it in the morning, but just don't have it too late in the day. A moderate amount of caffeine is generally classed as about three cups or 250 milligrams. Now, the reason I say 250 milligrams is that if you are someone who is making use of your hourly walk or run and you're actually using energy drinks or um, electrolyte tablets that have caffeine in, remember some of those contain actually a huge amount of caffeine. And that table that you're looking at just illustrates the variation in the amount of caffeine depending on what you are choosing. Um, green tea does contain some caffeine, however, it also contains L-theanine, and L-theanine actually helps to calm the mind and improve focus and concentration. So for some people, making a switch in the afternoon to green tea still allows that element of that little buzz, but it does not disrupt their sleep, and it also improves focus and concentration. So that might be a good option. And of course, there are decaf varieties as well. Let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> now, the other area that um, can be very tempting when we're in lockdown is to open that bottle of wine or have that beer in the evening. And uh, from maybe once a week, it may be creeping into twice or, or three or, or nearly every night. Now, the trouble is, again, alcohol can cause imbalances in blood sugar. It can disrupt our neurotransmitters that affect our mood and our thinking. And of course, if you're watching your weight and you don't want to put on weight during lockdown, remember, it's also relatively high in calories. Now, some people think that drinking alcohol helps them sleep. Well, there is a little bit of truth in that. However, what we're talking about here is quality sleep. So what happens when we drink alcohol before bed is it can enhance what's called the slow wave sleep patterns called delta activity. So they can often help us get to sleep. However, it also switches on alpha activity, which inhibits restorative sleep. So alcohol blocks our REM sleep. So even if you feel, feel that you are falling asleep faster, you are much more likely to wake up in the night and have disruptive sleep and not have deep quality sleep. And that's really important when we're talking about immune health and helping with resilience. So just hold and watch how much you are drinking. So let's move on to the next slide. Now, it's not just about what you can take out. It's also about other areas in your body that can actually have been shown in studies to really help with our resilience, our mood and depression. And one of those is all the research now on the microbiome. So I've actually written a whole book on, on gut health and we talk a lot about the gut brain access. But we now know from a lot of the research, which is still ongoing, how our gut microbiome, those the balance of bacteria yeast in our gut actually can influence how we think and how we feel. And we have what's called this bi-directional relationship um, between our gut and our brain called the gut-brain axis. So we have our central nervous system, which houses our brain and our spinal cord, and that links with our enteric nervous system, which is in our gut. So the bacteria in our gut, um, can actually produce a number of chemicals, including neurotransmitters like serotonin, like dopamine. Um, and so they can have a profound effect on our brain and how we think, but equally stressful thoughts and lack of sleep have been shown to alter our microbiome. So it's a two-way process. So we look after our gut and we can also look after our brain as well. Now, there's lots of things that can influence your gut flora, what you eat on a daily basis, your lifestyle choices, medications that you may be on, past history can all influence the shape of your gut flora. Um, and whether or not you struggle with ongoing digestive systems or not, such as, you know, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pains, um, we still need to be nourishing our gut if we want to look after our resilience. Um, and our, our mood. So 
try and get in on a daily basis some fermented foods. That doesn't mean you have to um, start making your own sauerkraut or kimchi. Just having, you know, a half a cupful of yogurt on a daily basis, for example, having some miso in some of your meals. Um, these can all be very effective ways to just keep our gut microbiome healthy and diverse. And then you also need sufficient fiber rich foods on a regular basis. So oats are a great example, vegetables of all sorts, um, polyphenol rich berries. These also have been shown to support a healthy gut flora. So include these. So an easy snack would be some yogurt and berries a great combination maybe adds a handful of oats as well and you're getting the all the combination of probiotic rich foods and prebiotic rich foods so let's move on to the next slide so we've mentioned about our gut the other thing we need to do is is look at the selection of foods that's on our plate when you look at the research on mental health a lot of it is going back time and time again to adopting a Mediterranean style of eating. Um, and one of the reasons it seems to be so beneficial is because it's rich in seasonal, colorful fruits and vegetables. These are incredibly high in nutrients per se, but they're also high in antioxidants. Um, many of them are also very supportive of our gut flora, as we've mentioned. Um, many of them also, because of their high levels of antioxidants, also will support your immune system. So another good reason to include as much variety as possible. And I'm a great fan of using frozen bags of fruits and vegetables. Not only are they convenient, but they're incredibly rich in nutrients because they are picked and frozen. And so they retain a lot of those nutrients. So if you can't get access to lots of fresh vegetables at the moment, just stock up on some bags of frozen mixed vegetables. Um, you'll see that diagram there. It's just a little um, way of how you would build a smoothie. One of the easiest ways of cramming more into your diet and, and your children's diets is to make smoothies. Um, and that can be a great way of hiding a handful of spinach leaves, getting another cup full of fruit in there. Um, for a lot of people, they will also add a scoop of protein powder and then some nuts and seeds for some healthy fats. You know, smoothies are a great way of um, getting a lot of these elements in, in just one glass. Now, ideally, we ask people to try and focus more on vegetables for their nutrient density, five or seven different types if you can during the day, and then have two or three portions of fruit as well. Um, and that's relatively easy. It may seem a lot, but if you can cram a few in in a smoothie, if you can then have a soup with two, three in there, or a stew, or a stir fry, then you've pretty much hit your target. And with children, I always often print off a sheet of color and get them to pick different vegetables and fruits of different colors to try and maximize the variety. The more variety, the more chance you are to have a wide range of nutrients, antioxidants, vitamins and minerals in your diet. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, now, when we look at key nutrients for stress and anxiety, there are certain ones that will support a healthy adrenal gland. So your adrenal glands are where you produce your stress hormones and also have been shown in the research to help with resilience, i.e. your ability to cope with stress, and also lower anxiety. So I've listed here some of the key ones and the foods that they are contained in. So I'm not a great one of just rushing out and getting any old supplement. What I'm about is focusing on the foods that contain these nutrients that will really nourish us. Um, and if you like the research papers, then I'm, I've listed a few research papers there as well. So you can see B vitamins are crucial for adrenal um, health. They're also crucial for the production of all our neurotransmitters. Magnesium is known as our calming mineral. It calms the body, it calms the nervous system, it calms the mind. So if you find it hard to unwind at night, magnesium is probably going to be one of your key minerals to focus on. I'm more than happy to answer questions that are specific to you. 
Um, so please do put those in the, in the question box. And then two that are often low in people's diets. I often will blood test people, and these are two that are often low, zinc and selenium. And the selenium in particular for a lot of people. And these are crucial as well for our immune system. So for selenium, just having two or three Brazil nuts a day will give you a good dose of your selenium needs. And then if you're eating things like some fish, some chicken, some meat, you'll be getting good quality zinc as well. Check your iron levels, particularly if you are vegan or vegetarian, um, because low iron can have a profound effect on cognitive function and resilience. And get out in the sun. Vitamin D, the government has recommended people do supplement now with vitamin D and for good reason. But for this point, it's been shown to be helpful for anxiety, mood and depression. So it's really important you get vitamin D in your diet. It's not so easy. There are limited forms. So eggs, oily fish are two good examples. Sunlight is really our best source. And then I've mentioned some others that we've already touched on, the omega-3 fats, probiotics, and NAC, N-acetylcysteine, very good for anxiety in particular, found in protein foods. And if we just go on to the next slide, I've just listed another few more, particularly for anxiety. I get a lot of questions on anxiety. When you look at the research, these are the ones that come up, are supported in clinical trials in human studies on their role with helping to relieve anxiety. It doesn't mean they will work for everyone, but it's worth if you've tried other things to be looking at, looking at some of these key nutrients. Ashwagandha, which is a well-known adaptogenic herb, um, has a history of you know, hundreds, thousands of years of use, is also one that will help with sleep patterns, as would 5-HTP, uh, which is a precursor of tryptophan, which then goes on to help with serotonin. Do not take 5-HTP though, if you are already on antidepressants, it would not be recommended. Um, and of course, if you are on medication, please do uh, consult with your um, GP or consultant in case there are any interactions. And some of those like the herbs, you can get in teas. Um, so calming chamomile, lemon balm, valerian, passion flower, these are all well known to calm the mind and to support the production of GABA, which again helps to reduce that level of anxiety. So let's move on to the next slide. And again, I'm more than happy to help with uh, any particular questions that you may have, whether it's for yourself or other family members. But let's just talk quickly about weight gain. It's very common for people to start putting on weight uh, when they are in a situation where their routine is very disrupted. Um, I'm running at the moment a very successful Lean and Nourish club uh, designed to stop people um, putting on weight, but a lot of people are actually using it to lose weight and they're actually feeling healthier than they ever have. So we can use lockdown to our advantage. Take this as an opportunity to rethink your um, uh, meal planning. But the key elements here are you should try and stick to a routine. When we... <clears throat> have a change in our schedule that can often lead to boredom eating. It can lead to elements of downtime, which means that we may overindulge. Uh, it may also mean that uh, we're eating more erratically. All of those can often lead to us putting on weight. And I would say if you are worried about putting on weight and you are not being that active, maybe you're not going to the gym where you were doing before and you're not uh, you know, running or and you know, making use of that hour long exercise time that we've been allowed, then you may actually want to mentally reduce your calories. Now that doesn't have to be drastic calorie restriction. It could just be you forego that chocolate bar in the afternoon and that will save you two or 300 calories. Now over the course of the week, the month, that will make a difference to what's on the scale. So remember, it doesn't have to be drastic, but because your activity may well be reduced, you may want to reduce just very slightly your overall calories. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, and make use of meal planning. I find this absolutely vital if you're trying to prevent weight gain or you just want to eat healthier. And it may be now that you're not um, spending an hour each way commuting. 
in which case use that time whether that's to do your daily exercise whether that's to um, prep your vegetables for meals later you know you might be making up a soup for later um, use that time and 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 be productive uh, in that time rather than busy there's a big difference between being productive and a big biz, uh, difference between being busy uh, <clears throat> why not try and batch cook so pick one recipe and double it up triple it up and utilize that for um, the week or the weeks ahead so you can portion it and freeze it make use of store covered ingredients that are really healthy canned tomatoes beans and pulses uh, stock the freezer up with frozen fruits and veg even frozen portions of fish and chicken are really easy to then defrost and use in recipes. And again, if you're tempted by snacks, get them out of the house and stock your fridge up instead with a range of healthy snacks. And we'll have a list of those um, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, but, you know, utilize your fridge for things that you can quickly grab that are going to be nourishing and are going to energize you. And if you're living alone and you're fed up with eating on your own or you can't be bothered, why not once a week and do a sort of Zoom platform and, and have a meal with friends or family who are distant from you um, and try and eat at the table. Avoid distractions like the phone, computers, uh, because the studies have shown that you eat far more when you are distracted. Try and be mindful when you are eating. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, and keep it simple. You know, we, we like to try and experiment at this time, but if you're worried about weight and not putting on lots of weight, chances are it's going to be a lot easier if you just keep things simple and lower the stress that you're putting yourself under. So for breakfast options, a lot of people might just opt for a protein shake. Nothing wrong with that at all. Or if you like something warming, then some porridge with just a handful of nuts and seeds or some berries. Um, an easy option would be some Greek yogurt with some berries and a handful of nuts. Uh, if you like something more savoury, then go for something like whole grain crackers with cottage cheese or smoked salmon or scrambled eggs. These are all easy options that will not take a lot of time in the morning. And again, for lunch, this is a great time to really cram in as much veg and colour as you can, whether that's a really colourful salad or a soup. Um, and make sure there's plenty of protein. If you're having a vegetable soup, maybe have some protein on the side. Um, and if you find that you get that afternoon slump or your energy levels dip in the afternoon, then maybe focus your lunch more on protein, healthy fats and vegetables rather than lots of carbs. People often will get that afternoon slump if they're having a lot of carbs at lunch. Maybe leave those to the evening. Um, and put half of your plate with a range of different vegetables, and that could be just a bag of frozen mixed veg, a quarter of the plate at least to the protein, and then you can have your, your potato, your sweet potatoes, your um, brown rice, whatever, um, as your carbs um, in the evening as well. For some people, time-restricted eating can also prevent that grazing in the evening. Now, what I mean by time-restricted eating is you simply just stop eating at a set time and then you allow yourself 12 to 14 hours of no food overnight. So for a lot of people, that might be I stop eating at 7 and then I might start eating again at 8 or 9 the next day. That's a very simple way of just helping yourself from that mindless eating in the evening when you're watching Netflix. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, and again, I've mentioned about snacking. You know, snacking is an easy way where we can mindlessly consume a lot of calories without really thinking about it. So ideally try not to snack. I mean, unless you're incredibly active, um, you may well not need to be snacking at all. Um, reach for a glass of water or a bottle of water and drink a couple of glasses first because often you might just be dehydrated and lack of dehydrate, you know, lack of water, dehydration can really affect uh, mental capacity anyway. And then if you are snacking, aim to keep them low, one to 200 calories and try and focus on something that's actually going to nourish the body rather than empty calories. So it could be, you know, some oat cakes with some nut butter. It could be just some cooked chicken, it could be a handful of nuts, it could be a small pot of um, plain yogurt, for example, hummus with vegetable sticks. 
again, it does not have to be complicated, um, but always just be mindful as to whether you really need that snack. And let's move on to the next slide. And uh, so we've talked about snacking. Now, one key other element is movement and exercise. If we're talking about stress relief, this is a crucial component and has been researched time and time again in helping our mood, our cognitive function, overall brain health, uh, stress relief, um, feel good hormones, serotonin, dopamine, endorphins. So, exercise is absolutely vital when it comes to our ability to cope with stress and relieve anxiety. Um, and ideally, um, you know, make use of that 60 minutes that we've been given, uh, whether that's a walk, whether that's a run. And if you can't get outside, if you are um, in self-isolation, then you can still do home workouts. There's so many online now. And even again, if you can't manage a full half an hour or hour, you can break it up through the day into 15 minute slots. And they again will add up through the day. A lot of people as well are now using standing desks um, or just take it, you know, putting their timer on to remind themselves every hour just to walk around a bit. Um, these are all easy ways of making sure we're moving more and it's really about moving more. And again, movement and exercise has been shown to help with sleep patterns as well. Um, so moderate intensity aerobic exercise, what I mean by that is a gentle run or a fast walk, has been shown to reduce the time it takes to fall asleep and increase the length of your sleep with people with insomnia. So again, I wouldn't exercise very late at night because that might actually overstimulate you, but certainly exercising first thing in the morning is a really good way of resetting your circadian rhythm and improving your quality of sleep. So let's move on to the next slide. And of course, when we're talking about dealing with stress and anxiety, we really have to also think about what we can do to really tap into what's called our parasympathetic nervous system. So our sympathetic nervous system is very much to do with our stress response. The flip side is our parasympathetic, which helps us relax and keep calm. And anything that can help stimulate the vagus nerve can help with this and it reduces our stress response. So it might seem a little bit um, a twee, but start your day with gratitude. A lot of people are now taking up gratitude journals. So before you roll your eyes, I know I'm sort of very much a science person. If someone just told me that, I think, oh, really? But actually gratitude, focusing on what's positive in your life can be incredibly powerful. And that could just be taking one or two minutes to write down a couple of things that you are thankful for today. Reconnecting with people, especially if you're in lockdown, if you are in, you've been told that you have to stay in self-isolation, is again incredibly important. And spend time on activities each day that you know nourish you and crowd out those that don't help you. So if you get very anxious when you are listening to the news, then don't keep listening to the news. Make yourself very disciplined and say, I will listen to it for 10 minutes in the morning and that is it. Um, there's a lot of community apps going on. There's a lot of neighbor support going on. Focus on your breathing. So um, being mindful about your breathing. Um, breathing out more rather than shallow breathing can be very helpful for the vagus nerve. Getting outdoors, again, getting that sunlight, practicing meditation, mindfulness, very, very important ways to help tap into that parasympathetic nervous system that can help us unwind and de-stressed. So let's move on to the next slide. So just quickly, I've got a couple of slides just on the immune system. And it, this is not a webinar on the immune system. We could do a whole webinar on that, but I get so many questions on this. And remember, you will get these slides. So of course, we know all the prevention strategies such as hand washing, self-isolation. But um, Susie, if we can just go on to the next slide. What I've done here, and uh, again, if people are interested, I can supply them with a whole range of references. These are some of the key nutrients that can support our immune function. Now, I'm not saying they will help with um, COVID. I'm just saying that if we want to nourish our immune system, these are the types of foods 
and nutrients that we should be looking at. Quercetin, which is found in a range of fruits and vegetables such as onions, apples and so on. Curcumin found in turmeric, zinc, which we've talked about in meat, in seafood, in nuts and seeds. Um, nut butters and seed butters are a really easy way of getting in zinc. NAC, NAC uh, which is particularly useful for uh, lung health and immune function. Um, again, protein-rich foods, vitamin D we talked about, oily fish, eggs, fortified foods, sunlight. Uh, and we go on to the next slide, Susie. Um, the other the nutrients and supplements um, are vitamin A, very potently anti-inflammatory, very important for the immune system. Uh, cod liver oil, liver, and then uh, the beta-carotene-rich foods are things like sweet potato, mango, carrots, green vegetables. Vitamin C, I'm sure everyone's heard of vitamin C. It's out of stock absolutely everywhere. But red peppers, berries, leafy green vegetables, these are all easy ways of upping our vitamin C. Resveratrol is berries and grapes. That doesn't mean I give you um, carte blanche to go and have loads of red wine, but certainly have some red grapes, have some berries, green tea, get those fermented foods and probiotics. So those are just some of the key nutrients in the research that have been um, shown to support our overall immune function. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open it up to questions. We've covered quite a bit of material there. So if you make use of the question box, I'm going to hand over to Susie and I'm more than happy to answer your questions. So Susie, over to you. Thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, thanks for a fabulous This Can Happen webinar. We've had loads of questions, so I'm just going to crack on. Um, what should people prioritise if they're on a limited budget? Yeah, good question. So what I always, and again, when I've been doing these sort of lean and nourish clubs, we've been very mindful of, you know, keeping it um, low in terms of pricing. Make use of the freezer. If you've got a freezer, Frozen vegetables are actually very cheap and they won't go off. So you're not going to waste stuff by you buying it and throwing it out. Canned beans and pulses, peanut butter or another nut butter, which are good staples that are going to spend, you know, a long time without going off. Um, these are easy options that are cheap. Bags of lentils, bags of um, beans and pulses, if you want to cook them yourself, are so, so cheap. Um, and then if you want uh, fruit, then I would say if you can afford some berries from a nutritional point of view, and that could be a bag of frozen berries, which are much cheaper, um, those would be also good options. Always try and focus on those key elements. Fat, so canned sardines and mackerel, super cheap. Um, protein, which of course, again, could be your beans and pulses as well as that canned fish. If you can afford bags of frozen chicken portions, then again, good options, they're not gonna go off. And then a very easy, cheap one for the brain, eggs, very cheap. Thank you. Is it better to drink a smoothie than to eat the fruit? So that really depends, a very good question. Um, a smoothie, you contain all of the fiber. So I'm not saying a fruit juice, we're saying a smoothie where you're blending it all up. And for some people, they actually find that more digestible than eating a piece of fruit. The benefit of a smoothie is you can cram in a lot of other things as well. So if you are trying desperately to get your children to have a range of greens or to have some healthy fats and you want to put some healthy oils in there, for example, then a smoothie is such a good option. Um, so both are great. Um, it really depends on what your goal is. If you just want an apple, absolutely just eat an apple. But if you're trying to cram in other things as well, then a smoothie may be a good option because you still get all that fibre just as you would if you were eating it raw. Great, thank you. So we've had a couple about um, people with nut allergies and any alternatives um, to Brazil nuts or nuts that you might suggest for snacks. Yeah, that's a very good option. So what a lot of people do now, obviously, it's very variable. Um, so some people, if they have a nut allergy, can cope with sesame. They not always can, but they can. Um, and so tahini, so tahini spread, which is sesame seeds paste, is a really good option as a spread on a cracker. Incredibly nutrient dense, very high in calcium, magnesium, zinc, really nutritious. Um, and also found obviously in hummus. 
Um, so that would be a really good substitute as well. Um, I mean, lots of the other snacks that we mentioned, like having oat cakes, rice crackers, whole grain crackers, um, are all obviously suitable. Um, and then what I would do is spread them with another type of protein. So if you can't do something like tahini, obviously there's lots of other nut spreads. So if you, you can't do Brazil, but you can do cashew, you could get cashew nut butter. Um, but if you can't do that, then something like a soft cheese, cottage cheese, slices of smoked salmon, um, those would all be good ways of adding some protein onto that um, cracker. Great, thank you. Are there any current known supply issues of supplements which you might be need to be aware of? Do you know? Um, well, there, there are some. Um, I'll be honest with you. We, um, in clinic, we use practitioner brands. And unfortunately, some of those brands are overseas brands. So they're American brands. And uh, so there's been a few issues at customs because obviously there aren't so many people at customs doing the checking. So there have been a few delays. I think there was initially, um, but now, uh, as far as I'm aware, with a lot of my clients, they are able to get the supplements that they need. Um, I mean, you know, obviously there's the Amazons of this world, but there's an awful lot of supplement companies that will do online deliveries. And you can normally get those in sort of 48 hours or so. Um, so I'm not seeing any problems now. I think there were initially, but now that seems to have been resolved. Okay, thank you. Are there any benefits to intermittent fasting, 20 fasting for eating on stress levels? Again, very, very good question. And it really depends on, first of all, your health goal. What is it that you want to achieve? and also your current stress levels. So for some people, intermittent fasting, whether it's the 16-8 or a variation of that, can be very, very useful. Firstly, it's very good for helping with um, uh, preventing sort of that late night eating. Um, it's a normally a very structured way of uh, controlling uh, your, your, you know, the amount of food that you're eating. For a lot of people as well, they find that mentally, uh, when they skip breakfast, they are more um, alert, and so they function better. Uh, there is a danger, however, that if you are not eating nourishing foods in that eight-hour window, that actually you will end up putting more stress on your body because you're not nourishing your body as well. And when you go long periods of time of no food, what you're actually asking is your adrenals to work harder for you. So your adrenal glands, your cortisol, one of its roles when you are not eating is to keep your blood sugar balanced. And if you are already under a lot of stress, you might find it's harder and harder to do intermittent fasting. But certainly there is no danger with doing it um, over lockdown period. And for some people, it's a very effective way of, you know, sticking to a sort of meal plan and stopping them from putting on weight. But with any fasting technique, what's important is that the food you choose is nutrient dense and will nourish you. Yeah, because someone, so thank you. Someone's also asked about any tips for people fasting um, during Ramadan, but I assume that's a similar advice. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, hydration, obviously. Normally, um, during Ramadan, obviously, you can keep drinking water. I know some people choose not to, but I would certainly recommend that you are keeping yourself hydrated. Um, and I would actually advise people in Ramadan to be supplementing as well, because um, although um, you've still got periods where you are eating, you may not necessarily have the opportunity to get all the nutrients you need in. It's well known that a lot of people lose weight in Ramadan. Their calorie consumption actually goes down quite a lot. That in itself makes it harder to get the key nutrients in. Um, but the, the key point is always keep yourself hydrated. And a lot of people choose things like watermelon and so on to break their fast as well. And that gives them a little bit of an energy surge. And that's where I think things like the smoothies are a really easy way um, when you, you know, when you're not doing the fasting during the day, when you break the fast, have a smoothie because you can cram in an awful lot of good nutrients in. Great. So we've had quite a few questions about the difference between pro, prebiotics, what you might recommend, good, bad. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'm not here to, um, I'm not here paid by any supplement company. I will make that very clear now. Um, so a probiotic is a um, supplement, uh, normally a supplement, uh, that contains beneficial bacteria and sometimes beneficial yeasts as well, like Saccharomyces boulardii. Um, for someone who just wants a general probiotic, I would suggest you get what's called a mixed strain probiotic. Um, one of the most well studied is, uh, well, there's two that have, have got a lot of clinical trials. One is called VSL3. Um, and you can get that. Uh, I think they've got a website, but you can probably get that on Amazon. That one needs to be chilled. Another one, uh, which I think has got quite a few research papers from King's College London, is called Simprove. Again, that's the liquid one. Um, and you can get a couple of flavours of those. Those are very good because they've got research behind them. Another very, very good one, which has probably got you know over 100 papers written about it, is called Lactobacillus culturel gg very good for people who are more prone to uh, what we call immune dysregulation i.e allergies and things like that um, and then another very good one again research very well to support the immune system is saccharomyces boulardii again people will have my details so if you are confused i can always answer questions via email as well those are probiotics, and that's what the yogurts and the kefirs and the kombuchas are good for. The prebiotics are the fibres, and I don't think you really need to supplement with that. You just need to eat fibre-rich foods. These are the foods that the bacteria will feed on and keep nourished, and you, you'll keep a very diverse gut flora in your gut. These are crucial. So you can take probiotics, but if you're not feeding your bacteria, then they're really a bit of a waste of your money. So that's your oats, that's your berries, that's your sweet potatoes, that's your leafy greens, your whole grains. Those are great sources of prebiotic fibers, and they're important for a good gut flora long term. Thank you. So we've had a few questions about sweet fruits, for example, dates, seven or eight in the morning, first thing. Is, is that OK or, or not? Oh, that's very sweet. That's a very big um, surge of sugar. So they are what we call, I, I appreciate their natural sugars and dates have some good nutrients in them. They have some fibre in there. But you also have what's called a high glycemic food there. So it's going to release the sugars fairly quickly into your bloodstream. Now, if you think about it, you wake up in the morning, your blood sugar is going to be quite low um, because obviously you've been um, effectively fasting during the night when you've been sleeping. What you don't really want is to give yourself a sudden surge of sugar, which then your pancreas will um, trigger the insulin. Um, and then that will drive the blood sugar down quite quickly and then you'll experience a bit of a crash. Now, I would say if you're having one or two dates, say in a smoothie uh, or chopped in some porridge, absolutely fine. But if you're just sort of snacking on about six or seven dates um, and you're not having protein, you're not having any healthy fats, then that's really going to destabilize your blood sugar. I would say be better to switch to say some strawberries or some berries which have a lower glycemic index a lot of good nutrients and fiber as well okay thank you there's one about um, snacking why exactly should we avoid snacking is it just to avoid overeating outside of meal times or is it scientific is it to support limiting the number of times we eat per day yeah, so I think one of the problems with lockdowns that a lot of people are finding is this mindless eating. It's just a sort of constant grazing through the day. There is absolutely nothing wrong with snacking if it fits in with your overall calorie needs. Now, of course, if you're already having breakfast, lunch and dinner, and that's meeting if pretty much your, your overall energy needs, i.e. your calories, and then you add two or three snacks in as well, you are going to start putting on weight over time. For some people as well, it can cause disturbances in their digestive system um, because they're constantly eating all the time and they're not allowing their digestive system some time and space to, to properly digest. But I would say particularly in lockdown, one of the key areas, if you are concerned about you know, putting on weight, et cetera, uh, is just to stop the snacking. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so we're nearly there. Let me just see. Um, do you take all your supplements together in the morning? Do you need to space them out? Does it matter? Again, that really depends on what supplements you are talking about. Now, if you are taking a multi, then obviously you'll, you'll just, you have a range of vitamins and minerals in that. But for some people, for example, who may be taking an additional calcium or magnesium supplement, um, they might um, want to take that away um, from other supplements because there can be some interaction between things like iron and calcium and so on um, and therefore you can impede their absorption. Likewise, I wouldn't necessarily take nutri uh, supplements with a cup of tea, particularly if they were calcium supplements because again some of the uh, tannins and so on can interfere with absorption. Um, some supplements, like some of the probiotics, they will actually encourage you to take them on an empty stomach, like Simprove. Um, others will tell you to take them with food. So I think it really depends. Normally, I would say um, if you're just taking a multi and maybe an omega-3, that's going to be absolutely fine. First thing in the morning, all done. Don't need to worry about it for the rest of the day. Great. OK, here's my last question. Um, breakfast cereals, good or bad? I assume it depends which one. No, I'm afraid it does. I mean, I'm not a great fan of processed breakfast um, cereals because um, generally speaking, they have, you know, they're relatively high on the glycemic scale. That's not true of all of them. You know, I'm thinking something like all bran and uh, Weetabix, but they don't really have much protein. They haven't got the healthy fats in there. Um, you'd be much better off having, you know, some scrambled eggs and some whole grain toast, to be honest. Um, but again, you know, if you do like a cereal, then probably your best bet is good old fashioned porridge with some nuts and seeds added and some berries. OK, thank you so much, Christine. I'm afraid we've come to the end of this. Um, this can happen webinar. Um, as you can see on your screen, the next one is next week on the 14th of May, how to deal with your inner critic and find your champion during these times. Thank you so much for all of you for contributing so much for all your questions. I know I haven't got through them all, um, but as Christine said, I think her details are on this presentation and you will receive a copy of the webinar as you've experienced it today. Um, you should get that by email tomorrow. I know a few of you have asked, to, asked for like the vitamin recommendations and all that sort of stuff. So hopefully it will all be there when you get the, um, the webinar tomorrow. Um, OK, finally, in a second, a brief evaluation form will pop up. It's really helpful to us if you wouldn't mind just filling it in with any suggestions or feedback that you might have. Thank you. So all that's left for me is to thank you, Christine, for a really great session. Enjoy the rest of your day and your bank holiday weekend. I'm now going to end the webinar. Thank you.